Inside a fortified vault in Frankfurt, behind 3.5 meters thick walls and armed guards lies a treasure more valuable than gold or diamond. Not jewels, not oil, but metals most people have never heard of. Terbium, Dysprosium, Neodymium. These rare earth elements power smartphones, electric cars and fighter jets. And today, one country controls them almost entirely, China. Rare earths are the hidden foundation of the modern world, essential for permanent magnets, semiconductors, defense systems, and the clean energy transition. Yet China's dominance, commanding over 90% of processing and magnet production, wasn't always the case. The story begins in the United States. In 1949, prospectors in California's Mojave's desert stumbled upon what would become the world's most important rare earth mine, Mountain Pass. For decades, the United States dominated the global supply. By 1960s, America wasn't just mining rare earth, it was refining, producing and exporting them worldwide. At the time, China was watching closely. Rare earths were still obscure and their applications only beginning in color televisions and early electronics. But Beijing understood something crucial. These metals would be the oil of the future. In 1960s and 70s, Chinese scientists and executives visited Mountain Pass. Confident in their lead, the Americans gave tours, explained the processes, even allowed photographs. They didn't realize they were handing China the blueprint for an industry. Armed with the knowledge, China went to work. In 1980s and 90s, it had built hundreds of small mines and refineries. Cheap electricity, low labor cost, and lax environment enforcement gave China an unbeatable edge. When US producers struggled with the cost and regulations, Chinese operators undercut prices worldwide. But this came at a heavy cost. In Jiangsu, and southern provinces, the refineries poured sulfuric and hydrochloric acid straight into the soil. Storms washed away toxic tailings into the rivers, the hillsides were scarred and groundwater was poisoned. Local governments looked the other way, the industry brought in revenue and rare earth carried immense strategic value. Meanwhile, America faltered. Investors chased Silicon Valley and Wall Street returns, leaving mining behind. Molycorp, once the US rare earth giant, went bankrupt after failing to compete with Chinese prices. By the end of 1990s, the balance had flipped. China was the world's largest producer. Deng Xiaoping captured the shift in 1992 when he declared the Middle East has oil and China has rare earths. He knew exactly what he was doing. Rare earths became a pillar of Chinese long-term strategy. By the late 1990s, however, China's industry was messy. Hundreds of private operators competed, illegal mines spread across provinces, toxic runoff contaminated rivers, and smuggling thrived. The prices were so low that in 2021, a former industry minister complained, China's rare earth are not being sold at a rare price, but at an earth price. Beijing's answer was ruthless. In 2011, it launched the 1 plus 5 consolidation strategy. Provincial officials raided mines, seized contraband, even dynamited illegal shafts. Within a few years, dozens of small operators vanished, absorbed into six giant state-owned firms known as Big Six. This consolidation gave Beijing extraordinary control. Instead of chaotic competition, prices became uniform, and supply was regulated, and China's strategic advantage was protected. But Beijing didn't stop at home. Through Belt and Road Initiative, it began securing resources abroad. Between 2000 and 2021, China financed nearly 300 mining projects across 35 developing countries, from Africa to Latin America, from Southeast Asia to Eastern Europe. Officially, these were loans and infrastructure deals. But in practice, they secured long-term access to strategic minerals. At the same time, China used every tool of state power. Ministries set quotas and licenses, subsidies funded research, universities churned out patents, and when US and its allies restricted semiconductor technology in 2023, Beijing retaliated by banning exports of rare earth processing know-how. China also pushed its own technical standards internationally, ensuring global bias aligned with Chinese-defined rules. 
It was a whole of government strategy that extended from mines to the factory floor. And once China had control, it did not hesitate to use it. In 2010, after territorial clash in East China Sea, it halted rare earth exports to Japan for two months. In 2019, it threatened the United States with similar restrictions during the trade war. By 2023, it escalated again, banning exports of minerals vital to defense and chip making. Rare earths were no longer just a commodity. They were a weapon of economic statecraft. By 2000s, the United States had all but abandoned the rare earth industry. Mountain Pass was closed in 2002 after environmental violations and financial troubles. Investors simply were not interested. Rare earth mining was costly, risky and vulnerable to China's price swings. American capital flowed into Silicon Valley and Wall Street instead. One company tried to reverse the decline. Molycorp raised billions in 2010s to restart production. At first, hopes were high. But Chinese producers undercut the prices and illegal miners flooded the markets and Molikov was crushed under debt. By 2015, it filed for bankruptcy and America's lead was gone. Meanwhile, China surged ahead, building an entire value chain, mining, refining, separation, magnet production and downstream industries like electric vehicles and wind turbines. By 2023, it controlled more than 90% of refining and magnet production. Control of the full supply chain means it's not just profits, but it's power. Still, new US players have begun to emerge. Neocorp in Nebraska and Phoenix Tailings in Massachusetts are rebuilding capacity. Phoenix Tailings, for example, uses clean tech methods to extract rare earths from waste and already processed magnets for automotive and defense companies. In 2025, when China tightened the export licenses and supply collapsed, the US investors finally woke up. Phoenix Tailings secured a major funding hinting at a possible American comeback. But the gap is enormous. China not only has reserves at home, but also stakes in mines abroad. Its Belt and Road projects lock in supplies, and Beijing continues to threat rare earth as a strategic weapon. For the United States, this isn't about smartphones or cars. Rare earths are mission critical for defense, from jet fighters to missile guidance systems. A cutoff could paralyze entire sectors of national security. The story of rare earth is ultimately a story of how China turned a long-term vision, environmental sacrifice, and whole of government strategy into a global dominance, and how America, despite its early read, lost ground by ignoring the industry's strategic importance. Now, as the demand for clean energy and defense technologies surge, the world faces a stark choice. Accept Chinese dominance or build alternative supply chains at massive costs. Three decades later, Deng Xiaoping's words about Middle East having oil and China having rare earth have come true. Rare earth no longer are just metal. They are tools of power, weapons of trade, and building blocks of 21st century. The question now is whether the United States and the Allies can catch up or whether they will remain at the mercy of Beijing's rare earth empire. For more such videos, subscribe to Periscope.